The number one rule in car audio is to make sure your gear will fit in your car before you spend any money. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say you order four of these six and a half inch subwoofers. You'll probably put them under the back seat of a four door pickup truck in a box that spans the full width of your back seat. But I pulled the back seat out of my truck and I've got an amp rack that takes up about a third of the width in that backseat area. So I'm limited to subwoofer boxes that are about 32, 33 inches wide, something like that. So now I need to design a box that'll fit in the space I have and get the best sound possible out of four of these awesome little subwoofers. And we're gonna do that right now. You wanna start by looking up the TS parameters. They should either be in the manual or you should be able to find them on the manufacturer's website. Then we're gonna enter those TS parameters into something like WinISD or a similar program. I like WinISD because the price is right. WinISD is free but you get what you pay for. WinISD is a royal pain in the rear end to use. Let me show you what I mean. If you click on create new project, you see that WinISD has this massive driver database, but WinISD was last updated in 2016. So few if any of the drivers that you might actually wanna use are gonna be in this database. So you'll have to enter in your own TS parameters, and that is the most difficult part of using WinISD. If you plan on doing this a lot and designing a lot of enclosures, it might be worth your while to pay for something like Basebox Pro. I'll be sure to give you a link to both pieces of software down in the video description. So I'm going to click on add new and then add some new TS parameters. Here is the number one trick to entering your TS parameters in WinISD. Your goal is to let WinISD auto calculate as many of the parameters as possible. Let me show you what I mean. Right here, the QES, QMS, and QTS are all mathematical combinations of each other. So you can look those up on the Savard website and find them right here. The QTS is 0.527, so we'll plug 0.527 into the QTS like so, and the QMS is 6.728, so we'll plug that in as well and then just click out of the field that you're in into some random field. And what'll happen is WinISD will do that auto calculation. And what's gonna happen is the ones you enter are gonna be green and the ones that WinISD calculates are gonna be in blue. So if you'll just follow that process, this gets to be really easy and you'll be more likely to have parameters that actually work in WinISD. There's also a mathematical relationship between the FS, the MMS and the CMS. So we only need to enter two of those three. So our FS is 58.27 Hertz, the MMS is 71.2 grams, and the CMS will automatically calculate. There we go, 0 0.1048. Now the VAS, I always call it the VAS, is a function of the surface area of your subwoofer, the SD, and the CMS that we already have. So if we know the VAS, we can enter the VAS. If we know the SD, we can enter the SD. So our SD is 22.58 square inches. We'll type that in. And as you can see, it went ahead and calculated the VAS for us. Now here's one really important thing I want you to pay attention to, and that is the units. When American manufacturers specify the TS parameters, they'll specify them in a mix of metric units and freedom units. But the defaults in WinISD are all metric, and you can change the units just by clicking on them and cycling through until you get the units that you want. Right here, the VAS is in cubic feet, this is cubic centimeters, there's cubic meters, and there's liters. Now, when manufacturers measure these things and create the TS parameters, if they're using dual voice coil subwoofers, they're supposed to wire them in series. The next thing you want to enter is the XMAX. In this case, we have a 10.5 millimeter XMAX. The XMAX is important. You want to always make sure you include that. Now, the rest of the TS parameters are nice to include if you have them, but if you don't have them, everything will work just fine without them. Right here, you can see that I have the DC resistance, the RE, at 4.06 ohms wired in series. So yes, like I said before, these were wired in series when they were measured. LE is the voice coil inductance. What you have to remember is a voice coil is a coil, and coils are inductors. So if you have the inductance of the voice coil, you want to include that as well. 1.36 millihenries. 
And with those TS parameters, we'll create a new project. We will find our subwoofer that we just entered. And look, we have the driver data fails the integrity check. So I made this mistake somewhere in the TS parameters. Like I said, this is the pain in the rear part of WinISD. I actually fixed that off camera and was able to go through and just try again and was able to work this time. We'll do an enclosure with two drivers. We're gonna make it a vented enclosure, a ported enclosure, and then we get to choose the alignment. It really doesn't matter which one you pick, you're just going to take it and tinker with it after you're done give it a project name i'm going to call it the savard 6.5 quad box we're off and running this is an extended base shelf we're just going to go with savard's recommended box tuning one thing i like about savard they do a good job of giving specifications so what we're going to do is build an enclosure with a total of four subwoofers with pairs of subwoofers in two separate chambers so we're going to look at a box with two subwoofers they're recommending a 1.1 cubic foot box plus or minus 20 percent i'm going to take that plus or minus and i am going to bump it up i want my box to be about 1.37 cubic feet. For the tuning frequency, Savard's gonna recommend 35 hertz. So we're just gonna go with their recommended tuning frequency of 35 hertz. And that gives us this peak right here centered at around, well, 35 hertz. What's happening here is the subwoofers are playing this region here, then the port takes over and your low frequency is coming from the port almost entirely from the port in a design like this. Now, I know what you're thinking, hey man, if you're just going to use the recommended box size from Savard, why in the world do you want to go through all the trouble of entering all these parameters into WinISD? Well, here's why right here. We can use WinISD to find the rear port air velocity. Now by rear, we mean the port that is behind the subwoofer as opposed to a front port like if you had a bandpass box. So this is the port velocity 1.92 meters per second. The goal is to keep that below about 17 or 18 meters per second. We're all all good we've got it figured out right <laughs> wrong wrong because this is with one watt of power we're not going to be throwing one watt of power at this thing we're going to be throwing 500 watts to these two subwoofers so we go over here to signal and we change this right here to 400 watts well why 400 watts if we're going to be throwing 500 watts at these subwoofers i always model these things at 80 percent of the rms power because after you have box rise also known as mp rise and power factor losses you're very rarely going to get the full power from your amplifier so i always model mine with less power so now our port airspeed velocity is up to 38.4 meters per second if you're looking for sound quality you want to keep that below 17 or 18 meters per second so what we do now is we go over to the vent and we increase the vent size just for the sake of argument we'll do an inch and a half wide by say i don't know 14 inch tall slot port in our enclosure and now we get the port airspeed velocity down to 23.193 not quite to that 17 or 18 that we want but it's a lot lower what i want you to notice it's going to give us a vent length of just shy of 30 inches here's the part of the design process where you have to decide what kind of trade-off you want to make we can make this any size we want we can make it a two inch wide vent we can get our airspeed down to 17.42 that's right on the dot exactly where we want it at but look at the vent length the port is now 40 inches long in order to get that airspeed velocity down we got to make our port cross-sectional area larger that's going to give us a longer port this is the trade-off this 40 inch port might not be a reasonable port to fit inside of your enclosure you've got to make that judgment call i'm going to go with an inch and a half by 14 inch tall port that's a little bit shorter a little bit easier to fit in the enclosure and just have to live with the higher airspeed velocity you are free to make a different choice it's your subwoofer it's your box it's your life do what you want with it before we move on from win isd we've got to check out the cone excursion so what you want to look at right here is the red line the red line is your x max anytime that green line right there is above the red line we've exceeded x max and that's not a good thing from a sound quality perspective if you exceed X max by too much, you can damage the subwoofer. So it might be a good idea to use an infrasonic filter in this situation here. But one thing I want to point out to you is we never go above 14 millimeters. This is a really beefy subwoofer. It'll probably be okay, but use the infrasonic filter anyways, because I don't want you blowing up your subwoofers. Now it's time to actually design the subwoofer enclosure. I like to use software for this. Some people use pencil and paper. SketchUp is a good tool. There are plenty of other great tools out 
out there. Scout Ship's just what I've grown accustomed to using. I'm going to start off with the rectangle tool and just simply draw a rectangle. After I have the shape drawn, I'm just going to type in the dimensions. I'm going to make it 24, 18. So it's 24 inches wide, 18 inches deep. Then I'm going to use the push pull tool to expand that and just type 0.75 to get it three quarters of an inch deep. Then just click on it three times and that's going to highlight the entire piece. Right click on it and choose make component. I'm going to call this top comma bottom. I like to use components because now all I've got to do is do a control C and a control V and I have a second piece that is the same component as the first piece. Let me show you this trick. This is a real time saver. I'm going to double click on this edge and then click again to highlight just that edge. Then use the push pull tool to push it in a little bit. And as I draw back, you can see that when I push and pull that piece, the other piece does the same thing because they're components and I'm manipulating the same component inside of the SketchUp model. And that is a huge time saver because the top and the bottom are probably the same dimensions. The two sides are probably the same dimensions. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the sides of this enclosure. What I like to do is just change the perspective like this so that I can make that easier. We're gonna make the side 18 inches deep and 12 inches tall. Then I can use the push pull and drag the side out to 0.75. Triple click on it, right click, make a component and call it side. Click on it, control C to copy, control V to paste and position it. And now I've got my sides. I can grab the top, use the move tool to move the top to where I want it at. And now I can reposition things just a little bit, change the perspective and draw the front of the enclosure like so. Use the push pull to drag it out to 0.75. Triple click on it, right click and make it a component. I'm gonna call that baffle slash back. And now I can take that baffle slash back and copy it and paste it wherever I want it at to make the front, control C to copy, control V to paste, move things around a little bit to make the front, the back, the sides, the top and the bottom. And then really, really quick, I can bust out a box. That is how you make a box very quickly in SketchUp. What that took less than three minutes for me to do that. Super fast. Once you practice it and get a little better at it. The actual box for the six and a half inch subwoofers is a little bit more complicated. Here it is right here, or rather it's one of several versions that I drew out before I decide on the final version. The steps involved in drawing out this box are the same as the steps that I just showed you a minute ago. There's just more of them because there are more parts. Now what I want to point out right here is this. This is a brace in the center a window brace, also known as a shelf brace. It's 12 and three quarters inches wide. It is the exact same dimensions as this piece right here, part of the port. When you design an enclosure, you want your parts to share as many common dimensions as possible. That's going to make it easier to cut down your sheet goods, and it's going to help you assemble the enclosure. For example, with this enclosure here, I can make a port assembly consisting of this piece, this piece, this piece, and my two baffles. Build those two outside of the enclosure and set them in the enclosure to put the box together. When you do it that way, everything's gonna line up perfect. Let me show you another example of what I'm talking about. Here we have another version of the same enclosure, but this time instead of having the L-shaped port, there's only one port wall for the port. And what you're gonna notice is that instead of the brace going from the baffle all the way to the port wall, it goes from the baffle all the way to the back. So when we're cutting this down on our table saw, we have four pieces that are 15 by 14. You'd make all those cuts at the exact same time to ensure that you've got a really good tight fit in your enclosure and then everything goes together seamlessly. One thing I want to point out right here with this design and one reason why it's really handy to draw these things out whether it's on paper or using software is we can see right here that if we install corner 45s those corner 45s are going to interfere with our driver cutouts. Well that is a problem. You either got to take a router and route those out after you've assembled it or now in the design process we can see if we can relocate our speaker cutouts and avoid that future problem. Let's take a look at a box that does that. In this version of the enclosure, I've just simply repositioned those speaker cutouts. I brought them in closer together and 
offset them a little bit. Now what we can do is we can take our brace and we can resize it, which I did earlier off camera, rotate it 90 degrees, use the move tool to find the new location for our brace. Now instead of the brace going from front to back, the brace goes left to right. The brace no longer interferes with our speaker cutouts, but that's gonna cause another problem during the assembly process. Notice this right here. Our baffle is 14 and three quarters of an inch and our brace is 13 and a quarter inch, which means we've got to reset the saw between these two cuts. If we do a bad job of that, we're going to have a problem when we go to assemble the enclosure. Rewind just a minute or two, I just showed you how to turn your parts into components. So because we use components, we have an easy fix. We're going to roll right in here and grab this inner baffle, double click on it, and then use the push pull tool to slide it in by three quarters of an inch, just type 0.75. Do the same thing with the outer baffle, spin it around, do it the same thing on the other side. Now the inner baffle, outer baffle, and the brace are the exact same size, so we can cut all those pieces together at the same time. All these parts here are all the same height, so you start off by making a 14 inch cut with the table saw, spin that piece around, and then make a bunch of 13 and a quarter inch cuts with the table saw. If you're paying attention, you'll notice this piece here, this piece here, this piece here and this piece here, the sides and those ports in the middle are all off by an inch and a half. Well, that's an easy fix. We're just gonna click on our component, double click, use the push pull tool and pull it out by an inch and a half. It's gonna type 1.5 and you'll notice the other port piece moved as well because I used components. So I saved a step. Instead of adjusting both of them, I adjust one of them and the other one adjust as well. Same thing for the sides. Gonna triple click on this thing to open it up. Use the push pull tool, drag it out to 1.5 inches longer. After going through several different design iterations with the software, I've decided this is the one that I wanna use. In the next video, I'm gonna break down the wood and build this for you. When I get that video finished, I'll put it up here for you. Before I go, I've gotta say goodbye to all of my patrons with a bonus shout out to $25 and up patrons, Jonathan, Sean, David, Fargo, JD America, Baba, Bo, and Dylan. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel and I will see you on the next adventure.